Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my house. Enter freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. Given that it is the most spectacular month of the year, I thought I'd do something a little different for the Halloween season and present a countdown of my current 10 scariest cases. And would you believe I actually didn't come up with that pun prior to filming today? Now, too, I kind of wanted to take this opportunity to present one of my personal truths regarding the paranormal. And that is, I've always viewed the unknown with more fascination than fear. And I've been interested in it for so long that a lot of my terror was kind of used up as like a six-year-old wandering across spontaneous human combustion in my Grandma's Reader's Digest compendium, Strange Stories, Amazing Facts. Fans of the unexplained will know exactly what photograph is still mercilessly seared in my mind's eye. That being said, to quote H.P. Lovecraft, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Past all the labels and all the theories and the explanations, what we are left with when we talk about the paranormal, when we deal with the paranormal, is truly dealing with the unknown. And that is a source of great discomfort for many people. So, without further ado, let's start this countdown. Number 10 comes from Jenny Randall's fantastic book Mind Monsters, the chapter entitled Earth Monsters. It details the case of a witness named Ken, who served in the British barracks on the island of Cyprus in September of 1968. Responsible for looking after the upper floor of the building's left wing, Ken had his own private quarters that faced the stairwell. On this particular evening, he was awakened around three in the morning by his fierce Turkish wolfhound guard dog, which soon retreated from its normally fearless position and ran whimpering under Ken's bed. Ken soon picked up this high-pitched whining noise and opened the door to see a truly bizarre apparition, which came floating, not walking, up the stairwell. Wearing a light blue jumpsuit, this thing had a flat orange face with large staring red eyes. It had rough red hair which stuck out in all directions, and its head rotated all the way around its left shoulder so it could stare unblinkingly at Ken. Ken immediately retreated into the room and bolted the door behind him, grabbing his underwater fishing spear gun and diver's knife. He proceeded to sit down on the bed facing the door outside of which the high-pitched noise escalated, along with a strange sliding sound. Once these departed, Ken absolutely collapsed. When he awoke in the morning, he was still clutching his weapons by his side. Unfortunately enough, his dog never actually recovered from the shock of the event and was, as Ken stated, completely useless as a guard dog ever after. The lasting impression on the dog, combined with just the absolutely nonsensical and strange description of the creature, including as it turned its head slowly to just stare at the witness, is exactly what launches this one right into my top 10. Um, you know, again, I deal a lot with things which seem almost nonsensical, and there is kind of nonsensicality to this. Too, whenever I think about it, I think of the um, the big red monster from Looney Tunes, which, I don't know, for some reason, as a kid really freaked me out. Maybe that's kind of why this one. Also, when I read it, I couldn't get it out of my head for like a week. Now, number nine. This particular case of a haunting has haunted me since first reading of it many years ago in Chad Lewis's fantastic book, The Wisconsin Road Guide to Haunted Locations and involves one of Wisconsin's most notorious residents, serial killer, cannibal, and other labels, Ed Gein. Now, with a track record like that, it's really no surprise that many sites connected to this infamous person are purportedly haunted. Now, this makes my top 10 for the concept that, one, people, in my opinion, are often far more terrifying in their capability than strange entities. And two, I'm, this is kind of a long rambling thing, we don't really know what ghosts are. You know, a lot of people believe that they are spirits that are unable to pass on for some reason. Other people believe they're all demons. Some people claim that it's all just residual energy. However, when you have cases like this, cases of a major tragedy happening, and then you have this haunting that sometimes even seems to correlate with that happening, there is something very, you know, I'm not sure if even terrifying is the right word, almost more horrifying, very sorrowful about the concept that these events seem to imprint themselves so hard that not only do they outlast the event itself, they outlast the lives of those that were involved in it. And they just kind of perpetuate themselves as this echo of these oftentimes very tragic, very sorrowful events. So that to me is why this particular case makes my top 10. Number eight on the countdown comes from Valet's passport to Magonia. In May of 1950 in France, a woman was walking home to prepare dinner when she was blinded by a brilliant light and saw two dark hands with a glinting coppery tint appear in front of her. They then squeezed her head and pulled it back against a hard, iron-like chest. She claimed that the entity felt as though it was made out of iron, not flesh, and was extremely cold. As she was continuously attacked by this terrifying thing, she heard a laugh with a strange quality that she claimed sounded as though it came through water. 
The entity apparently spoke to a fellow compatriot at one point, and she was dragged through brambles and into a pasture when the attack abruptly stopped. Later, she heard a strange rushing wind-type noise and saw the trees reacting as though to a violent storm. So this account really details one of the creepiest concepts to me, which is being physically attacked by something that you can't comprehend. You know, there are several cases I've come across, too, where the entity talks to something else, just compounding the creepy. However, this case in particular, the woman actually was discussing how she felt as though these may be her last moments. Her family wouldn't know exactly what happened to her. And that is just really a harrowing ordeal. So truly, this is one case, too, that definitely requires more discussion, so expect a longer video sometime in the future. And from John Keel's The Complete Guide to Mysterious Beings, we have case number seven. And this particular case details not just one, but actually two very different accounts of bedroom invasion. In the spring of 1966, a woman who was then serving at the Air Force returned to her apartment at the edge of McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey when she heard a sound in her bedroom. Upon investigation, she found that her window had been partly opened and a pair of very pale hands with very long fingers was resting on the jam as though a man was trying to enter her room. She screamed and the hands retreated into the night. The air police actually searched the area and did give chase to a strange prowler, a very tall man with the sweater pulled up over his head. So that's a really bizarre detail, which only gets more bizarre, as we realize this was actually not the first occurrence of this type in this woman's life. Some years before, she had been staying in a motel in New Mexico when she awoke to find a large monk-like figure standing over her bed with one arm extended above her. When she reached out to touch it, it crumbled into powdery ash. So truly... You know, invasions of any type, but especially bedroom invasions, really up the creepy ante, as well as the concept that this woman had two separate encounters. The other truly weird thing is that you have to wonder, if she had been just a couple seconds later um, in the account from 1966, would that weird sweater-headed thing have been waiting for her in the room? I guess the other creepy thing is, you know, with these bedroom invaders, there are these accounts where people see them. You know, I know there's a lot of discussion on hypnagogia and sleep paralysis and that you know, those are all valid points. Um, in the case with the monk, though, it is really odd that she made physical contact with it. Um, and of course, the account from 1966, she actually wasn't sleeping at the time. It was literally something trying to break into her bedroom. Um, but the weird thing is, for every account where people see something like this, you know, my mind immediately goes to how many times is there just something that they don't see? Number six on the list comes from Patrick Harper's Demonic Reality, which in turn details accounts compiled by Patrick F. Byrne for the Dublin Evening Herald. A reader described their run-in with a banshee outside of Newbridge in County Kildare in July of 1912. They were staying in a hut near a derelict house. Around three in the morning, they were awakened by the horrible sound of a woman or girl crying. The witness claimed that they got out of the woods and set foot on an old road when they heard, quote, the most awful keen, more like a roar, coming from in front of them. It was at this point that they could see a four-foot-tall woman, though they couldn't tell if she was sitting or standing. They said that her clothing was the same color of beech logs, and true to many accounts of the Banshee, her head was actually covered in a sort of cape. She was moving her hands up and down, wailing. The next day, it was actually uncovered that the owner of the home, Mr. Kelly, had died in the night. Now, first of all, the description of the little being is strange enough. Especially anything with its head wrapped up or face hidden, it just trips a certain trigger on the freakometer. But the concept, too, of death omens is of huge interest here. Um, and this really kind of hit home for me after reading The Goblin Universe by F.W. Holliday, where he discusses quite a bit, you know, the concept of fate tying in with encounters of the unexplained and sort of questioning, yeah, how much of the future is set in stone, how much of it is sort of headed our way and we can't really stop it. And so I think that, you know, the Banshee in general, death omens in general, there is just a certain kind of very unnerving concept when dealing with that. Number five on the list comes straight out of Fairyland and is recounted in The Middle Kingdom by Dermot McManus. In 1935 in Mayo, Ireland, a 19-year-old housekeeper took the afternoon off to spend with the family, but first thought she'd climb a fairy fort which was nearby, which was not much out of the way of her path. Now, people became alarmed, however, when she did not return to the farmhouse, and furthermore, had never even been to see her family. Search parties were organized, which continued until midnight. Shortly after the last party returned to the farmhouse empty-handed, the housekeeper herself walked into the room, fell onto a settee, and burst into tears. She claimed that she had been at the fort and had decided to continue on her way when she felt a strange muscular jerk and found that she was walking in the opposite direction. She turned back to continue on her way, but as she approached the same gap in the landscape, the same thing happened. It was as though there was a line past which she couldn't even reach her arm. 
She was also impressed with the idea that if she relaxed in any way, she would die, as well as picking up on some angry, hostile feeling coming from the northwest edge of the fort. As night came on, she actually saw the searchers and heard them, and although she called out to them, none of them saw her at all. As suddenly and randomly as the invisible bar barrier had entrapped her, it let up and she was able to follow them back to the farmhouse. Now, truly, this is a highly creepy encounter. There are many accounts across all cultures detailing similar descents into the other world, and to me the vagueness of this case makes it one of the freakiest. You know, yes, she did decide of her own volition to go to a legit fairy fort, which is usually a pretty bad idea, especially alone. But once there, there were no signposts up ahead saying Twilight Zone. She just couldn't get back out. And again, for every one case where someone narrowly escapes some vague doom um, in these weird locations, you just have to wonder how many others weren't quite so lucky. Number four details, you probably guessed it, another bedroom invader. But believe me, guys, for some reason, this just trips a particular trigger for me. Well after Linda Scarberry's infamous encounter with Mothman in the TNT area, her life effectively seemed to become haunted along with poltergeist phenomena, UFO sightings, and even further sightings of the bird itself. Linda claimed that the apparition of a man in a checkered shirt would appear in her home, especially standing over her baby's cradle. Now, again, the concept of bedroom invaders in general, which, yes, there are a few on this list, are especially terrifying to me. You know, it's one thing to really say, whoa, I feel like I'm being watched. It's another to walk in on some strange checker-shirted man standing over your baby's cradle. The other really strange thing with this is that she truly believed that this apparition had a special interest in her baby. Um, you know, tying that into older accounts of changeling lore and stuff like that, there seems to be an especial fear of people seeing paranormal entities really paying special attention to their young children. Now, of course, could this just be survival instinct to protect our young? Yes. Could it be something else? Who knows? Um, whatever the case may be, too, the concept of the man in the checkered shirt, I had a shorter video on this um, sometime back in the past, which I'll include a link to in the description. But the man in the checkered shirt is simply such an ominous figure to me for how mundane it appears. Um, I mean, we're not seeing, you know, like the monks or the nuns or, you know, things in robes or alien beings. This is simply some guy in a checkered shirt, someone who at first glance even appears to just be a normal person. Um, again, I would probably be even more freaked out by an actual person in a checkered shirt standing in my bedroom because what the heck would they be doing there? However, in these cases, it's these mundane details um, that just cause you to question, why is it appearing this way? Why not some other way? What does this tie to? And for that vagueness, that's what launches this onto number four on my list. Now, number three also comes from Mind Monsters. In the chapter A Monster Menagerie, we have the tale of a Cheshire design engineer pseudonymously referred to as Roy Smith. In October of 1984, he awakened to a classic account of bedroom invasion. Yes, again with a bedroom invasion. A thin, five-foot-tall figure with a pointed triangular chin stood at the foot of his bed wearing a skin-tight black suit, and this being apparently radiated good vibes at the witness in the form of absolute calmness. Roy reported that as soon as he moved to try and see it clearer, it vanished absolutely soundlessly. Add into that that he had been experiencing strange precognitive phenomena, poltergeist effects, and electrical problems, and you really have a truly strange case. However, the detail that launches this into the countdown of my top 10 creepiest cases is this. Roy was short-sighted, and this thing standing in his bedroom at the foot of his bed had the proper amount of spatial blurriness as though something was actually physically standing in the room. And in the book, you can actually see Roy going over the concept that if this was some sort of hallucination, it should have fed directly into his mind. It should have been a clear image, but instead it was something that appeared physical. So here we do, we have the concept that, you know, these things seem to exist at some point between physicality and immateriality, because if it was something physical, how the heck did it vanish soundlessly? Now add into that too, that it was also radiating good vibes. And whenever something projects a feeling of calmness, I just wonder why they have to project it. It just no matter what, I am very suspicious whenever someone's like, oh yeah, well, the whole encounter was totally positive, is very, very suspicious to me. If I tell you that the second to last item on my list is entitled John Keel's Purple Friends, I understand if you might laugh at that. It does not sound super chilling, but the implications certainly are. In the Mothman Prophecies, Keel has a chapter entitled Purple Lights and April Foolishness, and throughout the book, he discusses these purple blobs of light that people were seeing all over the Point Pleasant area. Though it was in a later interview that he discussed how he became so familiar with these strange lights that he referred to them as his purple friends, especially in this one particular field. 
However, his tune changed after speaking with a gentleman who owned said field, who said that not only was he familiar with the strange lights, but he had to quit letting his dogs run through that area as he had lost several in that particular field. So truly, again, the ambiguity, the vagueness, when we have these light phenomena, it just, there's something that's so difficult to pin down. And the thing is, is that it's congruent with so many different types of paranormal phenomena. People see lights in every different type of paranormal situation. So it's rampant. And, you know, very often nothing really comes from it, but you still have to wonder, what is this? Why is it here? What is it doing? Is it something, some just natural um, geomagnetic or geoelectrical effect? We don't know. We don't know if it has some sort of intelligence behind it um, or what its source is. We literally know nothing about it. And in this case, we can see Kiel literally just kind of waltzing through this area where then a farmer says, oh yeah, my dogs have vanished there. So to me, just kind of, you know, that realization that you had been in a place where things had vanished without cause, I mean, I definitely would be mega freaked out by that. The question remains, would I go back? I mean, if you've been all right like nine out of ten times, maybe the tenth one is finally the time where he would have just vanished. I don't know. Now, here we are. The case that takes the proverbial cake comes from Linda Godfrey's book, The Michigan Dogman, Werewolves and Other Unknown Canines Across the USA. While someone wrote in to discuss his family's multiple sightings of strange canid creatures from Muskogee, Oklahoma, one of these cases in particular stands out. In March of 2009, the reporting witness's mother-in-law saw a large black wolf with red glowing eyes on the Chandler Road ramp. However, what is most terrifying is that the mother-in-law's friend who was driving the vehicle proceeded to slow down, claiming that the dog was in her head, saying that it was a nice dog that needed help. Finally, the mother-in-law succeeded in breaking her out of her super weird trance state, and the duo locked the car doors and sped off. Now, many paranormal encounters detail people behaving oddly surrounding their encounters, whether forgetting to take a picture with a camera hanging right around their neck, or deciding just to go to bed while a UFO is hanging nearby. But absolutely nothing is freakier to me than staring at, for all you know, intents and purposes, a legit hellhound, and hearing something in your head saying, Help me, I'm a really nice dog, really. It just makes me wonder how far this manipulation can go. And much like case three, whenever there's this, you know, vibe of peace or calming impressed on the witness, you just have to wonder if that is the intent. If the intent is to make them feel calm, why do they have to work so hard? What is actually going on here? So what about you guys? In the comments below, list off a few of your personal freakiest cases. And above all, I wish you a fantastic Halloween. Well, if you enjoyed this video of my current top 10 freakiest encounters, please like. And if you're new to this field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe to see what weirdness the future may have in store. Till then, you can keep up with whatever else I might possibly have going on on my website, justanothertinfoilhat.com. And for exclusive content, be sure to check out my Patreon page, which is also listed under Just Another Tinfoil Hat. For today, I am Zelia Edgar, signing off. Do we?